everyone. I'm the Myers fan, and I'm here today with a man who has done a lot for cinema. He is the man that uh, gave us the explanation as to why Michael Myers kills, but today he's here to bring us back to the most notorious haunted house in America, the house on 112 Ocean Avenue, the Amityville Horror House. I'm here with Daniel Ferens. Daniel, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. And before I, we recorded this, like I told you, I saw, you know, I saw the film. It brought out a lot of emotions. Um, there was some, you know, some anger. I got angry at Mr. DeFeo. Mm -hmm. So there, there was a little bit of uh, comedy. I sort of laughed at the part with the, you know, where they were chanting. Because I was like, why do they keep doing this? Mm -hmm. And there was even some fear. Like when she was running from uh, Ronnie DeFeo at the end. And then there came the sadness. Right. We were all dead. So, yeah. Um, before I, it's not a, it's not too much of a spoiler to say that they die since the movie is called the that's, Amityville that's, Murders. That's right. Uh, the Amityville Murders. I'm sorry, I can't even say the, the title correctly. <laughs> the Amityville Murders. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's tragic, you know, and it's 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 a horror movie, but it's it's also more of a, a family drama wrapped up in a, um, you know, a, a movie that sort of questions the the motives and the reality behind this notorious crime and i think you did a wonderful job telling the story thank you i i have to ask my first question would be how did you get into the horror genre what what brought you here i will tell you honest and true halloween brought me here you know it was the original halloween 1978 halloween i as a kid i i saw it for the first time when it aired on network television it was like the nbc movie of the week and uh i was absolutely horrified in fact it was so scary the rest of the family went to sleep and i and left me there i didn't want to miss the rest but i was terrified so i remember just sitting on the couch with like pillows piled up all around me so i didn't have to look at the really scary stuff <laughs> so um i just didn't know what to expect i'd never seen it i was i was a little kid um but it was that movie that really captured my imagination, to say the least. And, you know, I spent most of my junior high, high school years making my own versions of various John Carpenter movies, send-ups and follow-ups and sequels <laughs> of my own imagination uh, in a little town. I grew up in a town called Santa Rosa, California, uh, which is, ironically, the town where they, Wes Craven later filmed Scream, the original Scream. Um, there's a whole backstory there. To he actually was going to shoot it at my high school, Santa Rosa High School, and they denied him use of the school because of the violent content of the movie. And it was a big case. It became like a you know like a federal case almost for First Amendment rights and what have you. Uh, there was a big town hall over it. People didn't want this movie shot there. But you know my answer was. I'm, I started making these movies there. Now I have a career making these movies. <laughs> it just it was ironic to me that that would have happened. Um, but anyway, yeah, the beginnings of it all was, was truly. I have to. I, it goes back to the original Halloween for me, and that's you know the movie that's nearest and dearest to my heart. And the fact that I got to make one of those movies was you know a blessing and a curse, no pun intended. Uh, all right. But uh, you know, listen, it, it changed my life for the better. So there's you know there's nothing but love in my heart for Halloween Six. Tell us how this project came to be. The Amityville Murders? Yeah. Um, well, going way back, because I've been around a long time at this point, uh, surprises me. Uh, <clears throat> I had done a documentary on the Amityville true story way back in the year 2000 that aired on the History Channel. It was a two-part like, Halloween night special. And and the, the reason I did that was because I was just legitimately interested in... The, the backstory, the, the the true story behind the book, the true story behind the the, the movies, and I thought, it was, and I think at the time it was like the 25th anniversary of the whole thing, so I thought, well, what a perfect occasion to kind of revisit it, and it took some doing, I have to say, to get some of the people, especially the Lutz family, who you know had lived in the house the year after the DeFeo family was killed, and you know their their claims of the supernatural began all of the you know hoopla, um, but. 
getting them to talk about it was a challenge. Um, and getting, you know, I even got DeFeo's attorney, you know, defense attorney, William Weber, to talk. Um, even those who cried hoax um, and said the whole thing was made up as a, you know, kind of money making fraud. Um, but what I have to say, when I came out of the, the experience of making that, I had to, my, my honest perception of it was that a lot of the people screaming and kind of like, holding up the, the hoax flag were were kind of the ones who had more of an agenda than the people who said it was a haunting. Most of those people who wrote books about a hoax and all that, they were just kind of disgruntled. One one was this, you know, I guess he called himself a vampirologist and he wanted to be famous by investigating the house. And the Lutzes had pulled the plug on that because they didn't want a vampirologist in the house. They wanted a real investigator to see what was going on there. Um, so he was sour grapes and wrote a book about, you know, how it was all made up. And then William Weber, the defense attorney, he wanted to make his own book, you know, on the DeFeo case. And I think the Lutz's book came out and kind of, you know, put water on his plans for a book. So I don't know, it just it felt to me like they had more of an agenda to say it was a hoax. And I have to say, having met the Lutzes and actually having been friends with the family for as many years as I have, um, I just didn't see that they were in it for the money. I didn't see that they were, they certainly hadn't made a lot of money on those first movies, uh, book or even, I think I think Jay Anson, the author of the book, made a lot of money, the publishers, the studios, but I didn't see that the family had really cashed in on it. Um, and, you know, I think that their testimony was so compelling to me because I could see, I could see them off camera and then I could see them on camera, if you will, you know, and when they talked about that house, even if it wasn't on camera, it, just something affected them. You know, George Lutz in particular, he was this sort of very, um, you know, garrulous, fun to be around, kind of lighthearted person when you were just in a normal conversation. But whenever the topic of that house came up, there was almost like a, a dark shadow, almost, not to be dramatic, but he, he changed, you know, his body language changed, his tone of his voice. He became more withdrawn. Like it just, you could tell that whatever had happened there had really affected him. And I think his, more than himself, I think his concern was what it, what it did to the kids, you know? So it was, it was, it was interesting. But yeah, so that's where it all began was, was my connection with the documentary. And then years later, it had always been in the back of my mind, like, gosh, you know, there's never been a real movie that kind of explored the DeFeo side of it. It's always been sort of like, the beginning of, of one of the Amityville movies, they'll recreate the murder scene. Um, and then, of course, there was Amityville 2, The Possession, which was kind of a prequel that they marketed it as. But they didn't use the DeFeo names. They really changed the story. It was very much trying to be in the vein of The Exorcist um, with the possessed teenager and the priest coming to the house and, you know, and, and all kinds of, you know, wild things happening. Really well-made movie, really scary movie. It's probably the, I think, of all of those movies of that time period, I think it was the most stunning, you know, in terms of its visuals and and just the darkness of it. I thought it was a really effective one. Um, but I just, I wanted to sort of explore the relationships of the family members and, and portray them as obviously how I might have seen them because I didn't know them. Uh, all we have are, you know, trial transcripts and books and things that are in documentaries that have been made over the years. But I wanted to kind of focus it on my perspective. Well, I thought you did a fantastic job. I love the way you sort of took uh, took us all over the house because I've always wondered, what does the house look like on the inside? Because mm -hmm. I only got to see the outside of the house. So, hey. no, you made it seem like a real house. Mm. There was no slime coming out of the wall, and yeah. <laughs> right. You just yeah, made... I avoided that, you know. I I'd also listen. I mean, those were events that you know, according to the Lutzes, occurred later. I even their testimony was well. Well, it wasn't what, like in the movie where you saw blood dripping down the walls and the house was shaking as we were running for our lives. You know, that was all Hollywood's dramatic effect. Um, but. You know, I wanted to see, like I said, these this family, and and frankly, you know, I had because of the research I had done, I had most of the crime scene photos, so I had real photos of how the house looked at the time. So we, in full credit to my production designer Billy Jed and his his great team of of uh, art directors and art people, who um, 
who kind of transformed. We shot it in a real house in Los Angeles, which was amazing. We found something that looked so similar. Um, and he transformed that house with very little money uh, to what it looks like in the movie, which is very, very faithful in many ways to the way the house looked when the DeFeos lived in it. The red carpeting going up the stairs, the gold sort of tacky curtains at the top of the stairwell. Even we replicated the family portraits, which hung on the staircase, uh, on the wall adjoining the staircase. Um, and we posed the actors in the film exactly as they were in those family oil paintings that, that sort of hung very prominently in the house. So, And we even actually even went so far as to recreate the tile in the foyer. So as you walk through the door, the tile you see on the floor, is that's exactly how it looked. Um, so it was interesting when we stepped into that world as a, as a crew and as a cast, you really felt like you were there. It was really interesting and, and it helped, I think, with the experience of making it. So my, my third question would be, and again, let me say before I ask you my third question, you did a fantastic job on the film. Congratulations and kudos to you and your crew and the production crew and all those people awesome job man awesome yeah, job thank you. yeah i mean it was it was very much a you know a labor of love for all of us we didn't have a big budget we didn't have the resources that you have on a big studio movie but everybody kind of came together and we wanted to make it good and we really cared about trying to um tell this story in as real way as we possibly could um and i i really enjoyed working with with that team and and our cast just was was really into it. And I have to give just major props to John Robinson, who played Butch. And um, he was an actor that I had seen in a few films, like Transformers. And he was in um, this really interesting Gus Van Sant movie called Elephant that was kind of inspired by the uh, Columbine tragedy. And I just thought John was a terrific and very intense actor. And I like the fact that when you see him in the movie, you don't know whether to sympathize with him or whether to hate this guy. You know, he's. Oh, I've seen him by the end of the movie. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, it, it was it was playing that thin line between victim and villain, you know. And I think he did a good job of kind of taking us to each side of that. Um, but as the movie goes on, you know, it certainly progresses more into his own losing touch with reality. So I think that's where it becomes that case of like the main character is sort of unreliable. We can't really trust him. So everything that we're seeing, especially in the second half of the movie, is like you have to stop and if you look at it again, if somebody wants to watch it again, you kind of can see how the intention is that what you're seeing may not be real. It might just be from his point of view. And that's and that's what I was saying when I saw the film with my mom. I was like, okay, clearly what we're seeing is you know, what he's putting into it or maybe yeah. even what we're putting into it, you know? Correct, right. I wanted to put us in his perspective in a way, and that, that was, I'm glad that came through for you. I'm, I'm, that makes me makes me glad, because some people see it as just sort of, oh, it's another horror movie about a guy possessed. Well, it's, it's actually not that at all. It's, it's not that at all. Not at all. It's like, is there really a demon there, or did he, was it, was it the acid that he took, or? <laughs> yep, yep. You know, or was it the devil? It's whatever you think it was. Yes. But either way, what I like about this film, and I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, no, no. either way, whatever you put into the film, it was wrong what he did. And I like how you communicated that, that either way you slice it, it was wrong. So, right. Right. you know, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, it was an unthinkable, unspeakable crime, what he did to his parents and his siblings I mean those were little kids you know and I my heart breaks when I think of the loss of life there and and the the waste you know uh, uh, of the selfishness and the the horror of that act it it's so unbelievable and I think that's why it's the Amityville horror you know it's 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 beyond just the ghost stories and if you choose to believe them great if you choose not to that's fine too but I do think the horror of the house will always remain the the murders, you know. Um, That's what I always tell people. The yeah. real Smittyville horror is what he did on the night 
of November 13th of 1974. It has nothing to do with the devil. Mm-hmm. It's not going to sit here and say slime in the walls. If they choose to leave, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. But the real horror was when he picked up the shotgun and murdered those six people. That's the horror to me. No doubt. And, you know, listen, and I think the thing that is so arresting to the public and so captivates people and makes them question all of it is, you know, those unanswered questions that linger on this case. It, it's it's disturbing to think that six people were asleep in their beds in the middle of the night. He picks up this hunting rifle, this Marlin, 35 caliber Marlin hunting rifle, which should have been heard for a mile and a half in every direction, and just fires seven shots out of this rifle, and not one of those people jumps out of their bed and runs for the nearest exit or jumps out the window, because I would have. <laughs> but Definitely. Uh, it's 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 that, and the fact that not a single neighbor heard any of it. Uh, it. It's like that is the part that makes me go, wait a minute, that that that's so that that just makes you get into that realm of like maybe there is that grain of something that was manifesting in that house that this energy if you will that prevented sound from being heard you know that put them in this state of you know of uh, almost like limbo yeah i can't i can't think of anything else it could be i mean listen i'm maybe i'm stretching it there but but it, it it's the one element of the crime that even the investigators who were on the crime scene, who testified at that trial, it's the element of the story that all these years later, almost 45 years later, even they can't explain it. You know, And there's a lot of people, I call them the internet trolls, who like try to come up with their theories of how it all went down and, oh, he had help from this one. I mean, some of them have such crazy theories. You'd think there was like a, a marching band in the house with all the people that were supposedly involved in this. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And it's not true. I think the evidence speaks to the fact that he did it alone. Um, Dawn, his sister, you know, he's tried to implicate her in this over the years, which I think is unfortunate. If you, you all you have to do is look at the crime scene photos of Dawn's, you know, murder scene. She was wearing a nightgown. She was asleep in bed. She had blankets over her, bullet hole through the blanket. I mean, there was no struggle there. He didn't, you know, fight for the gun. Um, there was no silencer used on the gun. I knew that. There was no drugs administered to the family they knew that from the toxicology so there's just you know you you come away with it going what the hell you know and that's that's the part that kind of troubles me the most i think most I people admit, i will admit in front of the audience that i did think that possibly there was uh ronald and one more guy and maybe they maybe they fell on the floor and the person picked them up and put them back on the bed or so i don't know i'm just no, trying not, because if you look at it, you have to go to the evidence and, and the bullets went right through the mattresses yeah i see what you mean you know what i mean they were lying in bed so they didn't move you know there was no struggle there was no like i'm gonna you know what i mean like kill them somewhere else and place them in the bed well if they if they really didn't then i don't know how to explain that because I would jump up if I heard something like that. So you and me both, my friend. <laughs> it just but, you know, it's it's one of the scariest aspects of it, and I think it's also it is it's that part of the story that gives people pause and makes them probably uncomfortable with having to look at the idea that maybe something else was at work there. You mm. know, that defies our own you know laws of science, if you will. Definitely. And my next question is. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what do you believe happened on the night of the murders? Mm. I, I, you know what? If I had that answer, I probably would have made a movie that just said, "Hey, here's how it all happened, everyone, and I've got I've solved the mystery, and here it is." Nobody's yes. done that, and I and I didn't want to attempt to do that. That's not it's not my place to do it. I just could only I was more interested in the relationships, to be honest with you, of how yes. he might have interacted with the sister, with the mom. With the, obviously the father who was such a tyrant, um, I just wanted to sort of see how abuse kind of infected the family as a whole, you know, and the denial of all of that, and how they would, you know, like there's a scene in the movie where he's, you know, the father comes down and he attacks Butch in, in the basement after, a, you know, a scene that, you know, all the, all the, all the friends are around and he beats him up. And then the next scene, which comes out with a new shirt 
and he's smiling and it's his birthday and everybody's singing happy and everybody pretends it didn't happen you know what i mean it's just that repression of um the the, the truth of what what was happening in the family and i think all of those emotions all of that negative energy was kind of you know kind of circulating in the house and in and among the personalities in that house and i think it created this crazy yet perfect storm for the violence that you know ended their lives yeah and the one the one scene that i like is when he he uh he used the the phrase uh mr defeo said in the film and I don't like to say this phrase, but he said the phrase "goddamn." You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't like you hanging out with these goddamn losers. And the and mm-hmm. the, uh, said something about moolies and yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I heard the, the term "moolie," I was like, you know, I, I couldn't believe I heard that. But I know. Well, well, also, you know, it was a very different time. You got to remember, you know, terms like that were slung around with with you know. Not a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of PC back then, as we say now. Um, you know, but I also felt it spoke to the per- the time period, but also who this man was, you know, that he would have been that crass, that mm-hmm. thoughtless, that, you know, bigoted, really. Um, you know, he came from that generation of just, you know, the good old boys. And... That's the thing. Uh, my My mom actually wants you to know that she respects that scene. She says, "I respect this guy because he's so honest. Mm-hmm. I respect him because he told he told it the way it was in the seventies." Mm-hmm. And she wants you to know that. She oh, thank you. I mean, it, believe me, it wasn't comfortable. And I think even um, Paul Ben Victor, who did such a good job playing that part, I mean, he he got it. He didn't necessarily like saying it because it's you know, but he understood. You know, this is this is the character I'm playing. This is I'm I'm telling a piece of you know, sort of history and a piece of Americana, if you will. I hate to use that word, but but, but that, this was where we were at as a nation, as a culture. You know, I could have completely imagine him being the guy who, after, you know, Nixon's scandal would have said, oh, there goes the last great leader. You know, he would have been that guy. And so we use that, you know, and I, and I really tried to pepper into the movie a lot of... Um, pop culture of the time, you know, from the, the you, crying you, Indian PSA, which used to air all the time. Fantastic job. Fantastic job. I oh, can't thanks. say it enough. Thanks, man. Well, you know, I just because, and I have to also tell you, you know, this also came from my own perspective as a, as I was a kid on the East Coast in the 70s. You know, I, my first few years at least were, were spent in the suburbs of Providence, Rhode Island, not too far from Amityville, a couple hundred miles. Um, and... I remember that. I remember that culture of like the cousins in the basement speak, uh, sp- uh, you know, smoking pot, and the mom yelling at the kids, and the neighbors just sort of dropping in, and you know, nobody knocks; they just come in. You know, <laughs> it was a very different time, and a very like, yeah, there was just a lot. I just remember there was a lot of yelling, and <laughs> a lot of just people who just you know were. I don't know. There's something about that East Coast mentality, New York mentality, where people are just much more like they shoot from the hip, you know. Oh, and, definitely. And I just wanted to bring that Long Island, Brooklyn sensibility to this family because that's who they were. They were. I mean, you can listen to now, even today, listen to Butch DeFeo in an interview, and that's how he talks. Yeah, and when I when I heard it, like I said, it took it took. I was taken aback a little bit there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because I'm a person of color. Sure, yeah. When when he it, said, yeah, I, it, it was never to offend. It was it was simply to illustrate. Here's the time in history where this was common. This is mm-hmm. how it was. We didn't. We weren't making that up. It was it was a right. part of and, the culture at the time. And you know what? And once that was explained to me during, you know, because she was explaining to me what was going on. Because obviously she was around in the '70s. So sure, she, yeah. You know, yeah. but she yeah. was explaining it to me and. She said, "Well, you know, that's just that's what they 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 just said, Mooley and things <laughs> like that." And so uh, I was like, "Oh, it was it was a very you know, I mean, and 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 to me the the the, the family, you know, and just, I know. Just, yeah, I, you know, they didn't they didn't think twice about just you know using these you know racist terms." Um, 
and 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 beyond the racist terms, I mean, to 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 you know mentally and physically abuse your family the way that he was he was doing. I mean, even the when he says, "I have a devil on my back," you know, that kid's like the devil on my back. I mean, DeFeo Senior actually did say that. That's what he he referred to his his son as the devil. Wow. So a lot of the dialogue, I mean, even where um, the mom has the, you know, she talks about this dream or this premonition she's had many times about how the family was going to die. And that she really did. She talked about, to, in fact, she said it to the family housekeeper um, that she had had a vision of, of them dying, but they would all be together when it happened. So I, I put all that. that I meant to tell you about that. That line is what really brought it home for me. I was like, wow, you know. Uh, yeah, you just did a fantastic job. Thanks, man. Yeah, I just you know I, I I wanted I wanted to show the dysfunction, but I also you know at the heart of it, strangely enough, I really felt like this was a family that actually loved each other. They just didn't know how to express it. And I get that. And by the way, I became interested in the Amityville uh, in the whole thing. I started becoming interested in. In 2003, and I've been following it ever since. So, um. so you definitely knew, you know, a lot going into this, and and I hopefully for those that like you that have some knowledge of the history and the family and all of that will appreciate some of the things that we did. But I still think for the for those who don't know much, I still think the movie sort of works on that level of, oh wow, you know, especially at the end, and we kind of recap the true story, and we do show some of the actual crime scene footage, and we show. Um, the funeral and and it's it, that's the part the part for me that's emotional because it brings you back to the the realism of the whole thing. Oh well, um, if if I had to make a comment on that, I would say that uh, this film is the real Amityville movie. If that makes any sense, all that other stuff. I'm sorry, but I I just don't count it. I don't. Right. Well, I have to say, you know, those who, you know, it's it's funny, even when articles come out and they, you know, they, you know, I've even done a few interviews and they list like the 27 movies that are Amityville movies that they're not. You know, what people don't get is that the Amityville canon, I think, consists of like four films that, that were officially like licensed, authorized movies. The rest of that stuff, like the dollhouse and the the bookcase and the, I don't even know which other ones they've done, the police station, the theater, the, the the sanitarium, all of these movies with Amityville in the title are not Amityville horror movies. They are people who have an iPhone or a, you know, or a, or a HD camera and they go out and they make a movie and they slap the word Amityville on it because it's the name of a town. And there's a loophole that sort of says, well, we're not calling it Amityville horror. We're not setting it in that house. We're not making it about the Lutzes. Um, so we're okay. And so they've kind of gotten away with that for a bunch of years, and I think I think it's actually, it's actually unfortunate because I think it confuses the public, you know, in thinking, oh, I'm buying another Amityville horror movie, but it's not, you know, yeah. these are just people who are kind of, you know, cashing in on something because they think they can. So, um, so I can't vouch for any of that. I've never really actually seen half of those movies, um, but I can say that ours at least takes great pains in taking us back to the house the way it was in 1974 um, and to sort of reintroducing us to the story of, you know, the origin, I guess you could call it, uh, of the whole thing, you know, the beginning of it all. Well, I, I think you did a great job, as I keep saying throughout this interview. And so when I ask you what you believed happened on the night of the murders, you don't really have a specific way that you saw it. Like, you can't see whether or not well, you think this person did this, or you think Dawn did this, or you don't have a high I, I don't. I don't have an. I, I wish I could tell you. I'm not a criminologist, you know, and I'm not going to pretend to be one. There are a lot of people out there who pretend they are. Um, I don't know. I don't think that's. I again, like I said before, I think only Butch DeFeo knows. I can only say what happened in terms of what the crime scene said, what they what they proved at the trial, and it's why he's in prison. He, he, he killed his family with the gun, with the, with the rifle. He hid the rifle in a storm drain. He went to work like nothing happened. He came home uh, or went to the bar and said, you know, my after work or in that, e that evening after, and we ran in screaming, my whole family's been shot. Everybody from the bar ran up to the house. They found everybody dead in their beds. And 
that's that. And then, you know, he was he was arrested, I think, within 24 hours or so. Um, originally, they thought it may have been, you know, a mob hit. In fact, I think he let them think that because of the family's supposed connection to organized crime. So initially, I think they brought him in because they wanted to put him in protective custody. They thought he could be in danger. And through their questioning of him, which didn't take long, he, you know, confessed. And, you know, then, you know, the, the trial happened and he was convicted and rightfully sentenced to, you know, six consecutive life terms. And uh, he remains in that penitentiary to this day. And he's, you know, had a lot of time to sit in this jail cell or in the law library and think about how can I, you know, create another version of the facts. I mean, at one time he blamed his mother. At one time he, pl he blamed the mob. One time he blamed, you know, obviously the, the sister Dawn. It's, it's just all over the map. And these are the words of a sociopath. These are the, this is the total lack of empathy, total lack of humanity. I think. Did. And that's what I can tell you I, I believe happened. So my next question would be, is there anything in particular that made you want to be a writer? And if so, what is it? Um, that is, that's a good one. Uh, I, I guess it's one of those weird things like, I, it, it was something I was drawn to at a very, very young age. I started tapping out little scripts for plays and little movies that I would make when I was a little kid. It all sort of started with Star Wars, but even other things before that, Towering Inferno and Earthquake, and you know, I was sort of always drawn to like dramatic, disastrous movies, I guess. Um, so yeah, from a really young age, I was just like always sort of in my imagination. And I think there's something about being a kid who, you know, we moved around a lot, so I never really felt like we had a home. And just, you know, there was a dysfunctional family environment and all of that. But beyond that, you know, I, I, it just it gave me a place to escape to, you know, my imagination. And I think um, I think that's true with most artists, filmmakers, writers. I think we all have a childhood that probably wasn't idyllic. And um, it, it was escapism. You know, movies were an escape for me. But also, oh, you know, when I figured out people make movies, you know, that... And then as I got a little older, you know, realizing that people make careers out of this, that that it became much more of a, you know, kind of an obsession with me to, to kind of break into that industry. And so I, I moved to Los Angeles right out of high school. And, you know, one of those stories packed up my little car and off I went. I and wish I could have gone with you. I would love to see Los Angeles. Ah, you should come out and visit. I would uh, love to see it. That would be amazing. I think you'd enjoy it. Um it's not for everyone, but <laughs> some people love it, some people don't. Uh, but that being said, you know, I, I I just started knocking on those doors pretty young. I was I was 18 when I sold my first treatment, and it was like kind of a um, uh, think of the movie The Goonies versus The Headless Horseman. Okay. And that was this thing I'd written called Sleepy Hollow. I was 18, and I sold that to TriStar. So when I did that, it was like, wow, you know. <laughs> I, I really, I really got to give you props, bro. I mean, how the, I'm sitting there getting jealous as hell. Like, how the hell is I doing this? Stuff? Well, you know what though? It's it, it was more, it was more passion and drive. It, it it was it was that. It was like, oh, you want to be in the movie business? You have to move to Los Angeles. Oh, I'm only not. I was not even 18. I was. I still. I think it was like a month away from turning 18 when I drove down here. Didn't have. I think I had two thousand dollars in the bank. That was it. I'm, uh, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here mad as hell. I'm like, well, I got treatments. I go. Nobody want to see my treatments. I. Yeah. I know how to write stuff. You know. You know what it is? It's. 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 It's always making the connections and putting it out. I think the treatment won't do you much good if it's sitting in your drawer. You know what I mean? It's. It's. You've got to connect this business is a business it's it's like if people don't know you've written it then how are you going to sell it That's, uh, you're right so there's that uh it, it's a lot of it is and it's and it's also connecting with people that 
hopefully like you, you know, we, that's the way life works. We work with people that we like as people. And that's, you know, that's always like that who, you know, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have that rich uncle in the business. I didn't have anything like that. You know what I did have though? I had a letter (laughs) or a few letters written to me by Frank Mancuso Jr. Oh, that's cool. He was the producer of the Friday the 13th. I'm sure you know, back in those days. And Frank, I had written a letter to Frank when I was, I think, 14. And he wrote back to me because he said to me in the letter, you know, I I couldn't believe this was written by somebody who was 14. This is like somebody 20 years older. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it because I think that you have a bright future. You know, so it was weird, like that validation (laughs) from somebody that made movies who at the time I didn't know, but he was the son of the CEO of Paramount Pictures. Um, you know, there is something to be said about a mentor or somebody having faith in you or showing belief, you know. We- for our dreams. And that honestly was, you know, having Frank having done that for me at such a young age, it really gave me confidence. And that that's what propelled me to keep going. Well, I'm just so lucky to be a sitting here talking with the man that wrote one of my favorite uh, Halloween installments. And if not, I dare say the best one. Uh, the original, but, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> You're funny. Um, thank you. Uh, that's awesome. It, 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 it astounds me that 20 some odd years down the road, people remember it, that it's still talked about. It's either loved or it's hated. I'm glad that it's gotten more love over the years because when it came out, it certainly didn't get much. Um, That was tough. I have to say, when that movie came out and I knew it wasn't the movie that I had intended it to be, um, it was tough taking the slings and arrows that, you know, the critics were shooting out and even the fans were, you know, writing nasty letters to Fangoria. Um, You know, there was always that little renegade group of fans that kind of rallied behind the movie because they saw something in it that they liked or wanted to like maybe but um i have to say all these years later there's like i said there's nothing but love in my heart for the halloween franchise even halloween six who is even though there were so many bumps in the road in the making of it um you know there's some cool stuff in that and, and i will dare say i'm gonna go out on a limb and say there's stuff in that movie that's i think better than the 2018 movie there's I just moments. there are moments there I'm not saying it's better. It certainly didn't make a fraction of the money that movie made. But I felt like we had um, an atmosphere, a tone, a kind of a love for the the, the original that maybe kind of dissipated along the road with the other ones. Um, it was great to see Jamie Lee Curtis, all of that. That's cool. Um, I'm glad it made a gajillion dollars because it keeps the franchise going. It keeps horror movies being made in this industry. But... I don't know what it was. There, there was just something for me that felt like it wasn't true. And I, I, don't, gonna, I don't know how to explain I'm gonna that. Straight up, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I have to say this before I forget. I'm going to be honest with you, because I don't know if you watch my channel, but one of the things I'm notorious for, I tell it like it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like I'm going to tell you straight up. The curse of Michael Myers... While it was strange with the woman screaming at the beginning, I want my baby, my baby. You know, that was a little strange. And the thorn thing, and all, but that was from part five. But right. the curse of Michael Myers is definitely better than 2018. And I would say that to <laughs> Malik Cod himself. It was better <laughs> than 2018, funny. sir. You're funny. That's awesome. I appreciate the, the love. Um, it's great. You know, but what's great about the series and is sort of all over the map as it is at this point, because there's so many kind of universes within it now. Uh, I like that fans can pick out the one they like and love that one. And it's OK. It doesn't take anything away from part four if you love 2018. It doesn't take anything away from the original Halloween 2 if you love Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, although I don't think many people like that one. Um, so, I don't, for me, it's just sort of like, pick your adventure at this point, you know? That's that's what everybody's saying, but I'm telling you right now, I, I, I like Halloween 6, and I'm not afraid to say it. I like 1, 6, and Resurrection. The rest are okay, but I like 1, 6, and Resurrection. 
See, and I love that people can, you know, and there's enough of them now, you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, you have to kind of like, you know, you gotta, you gotta sort of chuckle a little bit when you think of how many times Michael Myers has been shot and burned and blown up and, you know, all the other things that have happened to him. But, you know, I think it goes back to that, you know, it's the Frankenstein myth. It's like, you can't really kill the boogeyman, you, yeah. you know, that's, that's why it, you know, you can justify it. But you know what I do miss, though, about the movies? I miss Donald Pleasance. I, I, I love, agree with you. love that we had him in the film. In fact, a fan recently sent me, just a couple, the other day, he took a, he took this, I guess I call it like the prison sequence from Halloween 2018. Mm-hmm. And he took the monologue that Donald said in Six and put it over that scene. And it was so much more effective than what they had. Where they had like a voice actor do Donald. That's the thing. I, you know, I have to say this, then I'll move on to my next question because I know you're here to promote Amityville and I got off top. No, 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 it's fine. But I have to say, I honestly cannot respect anyone that does something just for the sake of doing it. If mm-hmm. you're going to do something, love what you are doing. If you're doing it just to cash in on a name, I mm-hmm. cannot respect you as a writer, right. as a director, as an actor or actress. And I can respect you, sir, because you did it, because you had the passion to do it, and because you love the Halloween films. And I sure did and do. I mean, it's never changed. You know, I mean, it's the I wear my Halloween, you know, flag and fly it proudly. I am the first one to promote all the new movies when they are coming around. I. You know, listen, I mean, I'm not kidding you when I said I was that kid that huddled on the couch to, you know, make it to the end of the original <laughs> movie back in 81. And um, and then Halloween 2 came out the week after that. And, you know, it to me, it was like a five alarm fire that that just kind of ignited within me. And, and, and it was those movies that captured my imagination. And the fact that I got handed the torch by Mustafa Akkad, who... Believe me, I, I, I have so much uh, respect for and, and miss that man dearly. He really, you know, without him, I don't know that I would have a career today. I don't know. Maybe it would have taken off in a different way. But but he gave me that first, you know, again, that validation, the encouragement. He loved the fact that I knew every line of Halloween 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. You know, like I he, he loved it. He would just walk up to me on the set and say, you know, who played so-and-so in this one? You know, and I would just tell him and he would just laugh. You know, he would try to stump me on trivia. Could, yeah, and uh, you know, look, I'm the same way. I, I absolutely love the Halloween films, and I think you no. know that, and I think that's why you're here today. And I, I want to thank you for that. Well, listen, I mean, so, it's, that's, that's it. And, 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 and if, you, if you don't love it, then don't do it. You know, and that's, that's, I'm with you on that. And, you know, I wish, I wish in some ways we could do the, you know, the writer's cut of Halloween 6, because there are so many cool ways that that movie could have been done differently you know now being the age i am it's always ever you know it's always hindsight is 2020 right so but you know maybe had i been a little older or had a little more confidence in myself maybe i would have lobbied mustafa to let me direct it and that would have been a really really different movie um i can't say it would have been like the definitive halloween sequel but i certainly think it would have been closer to the one that i envisioned i think that even he envisioned i think there was a disappointment you know with Malik and his dad and because they knew what the movie was going to be. And when they saw it sort of get tarnished in a way by the studio interference and just a lot of factors that went into the making of that, that sort of like ran the ship aground. I think they were just not, you know, listen, they, they walked away from the reshoots of that. They didn't have anything to do with those. Um, that was entirely Miramax that, you know, sort of stood in as the producers at that point and they just sort of went into these really weird areas with it and I didn't under, you know I was just sort of on set going I don't know what they're doing I don't know what this <laughs> like you gotta and I, I get a sense of that yeah and it was frustrating because you know you're and I was so young you have to understand like I didn't get the set politics I didn't understand that the writer had no say <laughs> you know so I was there going like wait that's not it, that, 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 you know, and, and it was yeah. funny, like, people like me and Paul Rudd stood there and were like, this isn't the movie, 
this isn't what we set set out to make. What's going on? You know, and I, I I think Paul got the unfair reputation of having hated the movie when when what he hated was the fact they changed it so much. Uh, yeah, I get that. So he didn't hate it. He hated the finished product. Yeah, what... and well, and the the finished product of the you know the theatrical you know thing that there was all over the map and. But Paul was like a huge supporter. In fact, one of the things that I remember the day that Paul found out that I was like this crazed Halloween fan, <laughs> you know, like like this was the moment of my life I'd been waiting for. And it changed everything for him. Suddenly it was like he would turn to me like, was that right? Oh, my God. This is the coolest thing ever. I can't. I, he's like, I just your story is the best story I've ever heard in my life. Like, when does that happen? The person that loves the movie most gets to make the movie. Um so he was super, super excited and um, couldn't have been more, you know, happy to be there, putting everything into it, um, doing, you know, going back to the original movie, wanting to, you know, put in little nods to that. Um, he got it, you know. And, and one of the things I remember him telling me was the movie that really affected him as a kid was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And he goes, that movie completely changed me because it freaked me out so much. My parents had to, like, take me to therapy. <laughs> so, oh. so, um, so Paul understood my sort of weird obsession with it, you know, and he, he, he got behind it totally. Um, so I was, I was happy to have that kind of nurturing support. And, and I have to say the other one that was like that with me was Marianne Hagen and Mariah O'Brien and that whole sort of, like, I, 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 for all kids, you know, I, and we were so excited. I've tried to get Mary in, but uh, she she respectfully declined. So, oh, did she? so she she couldn't be here. But she uh, somebody said it to her in the twenty five year convention. They said Jamie Lee couldn't be here, so I'm glad you're here. And I'll say yes. it to you, Mary yes. Ann yes. could not be here, but you could, and I'm glad yeah. you're here. Oh, so. uh, yeah, she's the best. She really and she understood it as well, you know. And I think she understood what what I was going for that she. Was playing a Laurie Strode character, you know, that she was embodying the qualities that the, the Laurie Strode we remember from 1978. I, you know, I think the thing with Laurie Strode was I just felt like she became too angry, you know, yeah. and and sour. And I don't know. I, I, I know victims of violent crimes. And you know what? They're compassionate people, actually. Really compassionate. Um, so... I don't know if I agreed with that take. Uh, well, I'll say it again before I get to my next question. I did not like 2018 at all. I, mm -hmm. I, I just didn't. And it has nothing to do with you or you being here. But <laughs> okay. I, listen, I don't have any, you know, listen, I, I, I respect the fact that it's a, uh, a mega hit. But I, I did feel like it was not entirely true to the way I would have wanted it to go but that was the way they wanted it to go and that's that's what they told and you know it's it's you know it's 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 the new one and the next one will probably change that you know so that's that's, that's what right. I think I, you know it, it, choose your own adventure you know uh, uh, um, Michael will end up being Lori's father for all we know <laughs> sure why not at this the, point. the next question is uh, you know I'm, I'm having fun with you you know I'm uh, really... you're cool man but um the next question is you're you're now a part of two of the biggest franchises in in the horror genre, Halloween and of course Amityville. Which mm -hmm. one did you enjoy working on the most, and why? Is that putting you on the spot? No, not at all. It's not putting me on the spot. You know, I, I have to say, and I mean to be probably maybe being too diplomatic, but I feel like both of them. But I will say, Halloween was because it was the first thing I did, and it was so near and dear to me. The, that I'll always have that one is the one that was the most exciting, you know, to to know and to I mean to walk on a set and Donald Pleasance is standing there like I I, could, I probably I, I was gonna pass out you know like you, like people don't understand like the level of of of, of geekdom going on in here so uh, you know I couldn't believe it I couldn't I it was almost one of those pinch me I'm I'm dreaming this moments. yes definitely. You know, so yeah, I mean, it was that. It was that. Nothing will ever replicate that time. Nothing. Nothing will ever come close to it because of what it was. Um, that being said, you know, Amityville was my first feature film as a director. It took me a long time to get to it. I'm really glad I did. 
I actually have much more respect for directors of genre pictures now because I know how freaking hard it is um, and the pressure that you're under from like a hundred different angles at any given time. Um, it's very different to be in the trenches to from you know being the writer behind his you know computer. So not that that doesn't come with its own set of like studio pressures or whatever and lots of producers giving notes or whatever. That's it, but it's different when you have you know people who are there to do a job asking you 300 questions an hour <laughs> and having to come up with answers to those things on the fly and not knowing if you gave the right answer you know and you won't know it until you see the movie so there's just there's a, that added pressure but i really enjoyed it i mean i enjoyed it so much i went on and made another one right after it so um but i loved and i do have to say i'm probably so much of a control freak that i like knowing that what was on camera was at least people love it they don't love it Fine, that's what I envision. Um, it was a good film. It was. I, I thought it was better than good. I thought it was great. I know I'm going to see it again. Now, well, when, he, when they get to the part where he has to kill the family, I, you know, that part is, you know, I'm, I'm going to dread, you know, that scene coming because you kept telling us all throughout the movie, it's coming, it's mm -hmm. coming. It's coming. It's even com the mother said, you know, it was either the mother or Dawn. I admit, I don't remember... I think it was Dawn that said something's coming or it's coming mm -hmm. or something. And yeah. I was okay, yeah, he's telling us on the screen it's November 3rd, November 4th. I was like, oh, oh mm -hmm. shit, here it here from. Well, that was intentional, you know. It's, it's, I think, the best horror. I mean, go back to the great movies of John Carpenter and long before John Carpenter, you know, the James Whale. I mean, anyone who does good horror knows that dread is everything. It's, you know, it really is. fires in Halloween wasn't, it wasn't that when he jumped up in the back seat and killed Annie, that was the moment, you know, it's like we knew it was coming. We knew it was coming. But you know what? He milked it. First, is he going to kill her in the laundry room? Is he going to kill her in the house? Is it, we didn't know. And, and it's that anticipation that is everything, you know, and the, and the punchline is the kill. But, but it's the building of that and that anticipation and the and creating that sense of menace or dread that I think is the best of you know that that if you can accomplish that as a movie maker then I think you're you know, a horror filmmaker you're doing you're doing your job right well you definitely did a good job because I I knew it was coming I said okay uh, <laughs> anytime you know and I, I lied to you not when when November 13th when that was on the screen yeah my mom said oh hell you uh, know here it comes. Yep. But even then, you know, if you notice, I did. It doesn't happen right away. It's it still plays out, you know, for quite a few scenes before the ultimate, you know, sort of defining moment of the movie occurs. So, um, you know, I really tried to kind of play with expectations, and you know, we sort of had that bizarre Last Supper sequence, and. Um, it's yeah, I but thank you. I guess you know. I'm sorry that it, it it's it, it it frustrated you in that way, <laughs> but I think that's that's the intention. You know, I think in a in a movie like that, you want to draw it out. And um, I mean, I always go back to Halloween and how he milked the scene of you know Laurie crossing the street. You know, as she's you know leaving, going from the Doyle house to the Wallace house. I mean, I've never seen somebody take so long to cross a, a tiny street in my life. But um, boy, did it work. Well, you, you definitely got us because we heard noises behind us and we're looking behind us like, is it a ghost in here? What's going uh, on? Good. Yeah. good, good. Well, I'm glad. And I mean, for that reason, but, you know, mostly I'm just glad that we, we made a movie that I feel like at least uh, pays a nod to the to the ones that maybe people are familiar with back from that time period, but also, you know, kind of reintroduces the story for a generation that may not know much, if anything, about it at all. I saw. By the way, I saw a a scene where a ghost had the glasses on it. Was that like a nod to Halloween or something? If you hadn't picked that out, then I would have been very disappointed in you as a Halloween fan. Of course, it was a Halloween nod. Well, I had to be. I had to be sure. I couldn't just <laughs> assume it was. You know. Of course, that was Bob under that little ghost. That was probably little Bob. Okay. Well, I, I'm glad you did that. I. I I pointed that out. I said, look, that's Michael Myers. You know, I knew it. I knew it. You know me. You know me. I'm not going to disappoint the Halloween crew. Thank you so much for that. My next question. There's other ones in there. You'll have to watch it again, but there's a few other ones. 
I, I'll look for them. I'll definitely watch it again, and I'll look for them. All right. Just... My next question is, how old were you when you learned about the tragedy, and how did it affect you? Um, probably, I, it was probably having read the original Jay Anson book, Amityville Horror, because it starts off with, you know, the tragedy of the DeFeos and, you know, what happened there. So I remember that. And I think it was just, you know, there were shows on at the time, like That's Incredible and um, In Search Of, um, which was hosted by Leonard Nimoy. I think it was actually like the scariest show on television that I remembered as a kid. It was this kind of weekly series of like unexplained phenomena. Um, and one of the episodes was the Amityville Horror. And I remember it was just terrifying. They had like this, this doll like on a rocking chair, and all of a sudden the lights go out, and the light and the uh, the doll's uh, eyes light up red. And I, I think I ran out of the room. Um, so yeah, it goes back to my childhood. You know, just it's very much of that whole era of, you know, those movies that were coming out and terrifying us in those days. So, um, so I think that's where I first you know became aware of it. Well, like I said, again, fantastic job. My next question is, if there was anything that you could change about your career, what would it be and why? Oh, <laughs> You're going to go there. Huh? Uh, <laughs> so, um, I, well, maybe I've already said it. I think I, think I would have been brave enough to... Ask Mustafa if I could direct my own script for Halloween 6. I think that would have been great. So, yeah, if I have one thing I could, like a do-over kind of thing, that, that might have been it. Um, just because, you know, we'll never know. You know, like, I'll never know. Just from my own perspective, like, I'll never know what that movie might have looked like had I been behind the camera of it. Um, listen, I, I love Joe Chappelle. He was he was a really nice guy, and he's gone on to a huge career in television and done other. He actually just did a movie with Jamie Lee Curtis. I heard. I uh, haven't seen it yet. Um, but I, you know, there's something to be said about, and I love that. Like with Amityville, and then my next movie is called The Haunting of Sharon Tate. Um, that I got to write it, and then I got to translate that vision that was on the page to the screen. There's something very like organic about that like I already knew what the movie was it was you know so I, I mean I'll bring up like a weird example but like the opening of Halloween 6 the first time we see Michael Myers you know he like appears out of the darkness behind the, the, the nurse or the midwife like I saw that in my head as exactly like the first movie and the second movie like where he appears behind Jamie and he appears behind you know Janet the nurse like yeah. Just that light that just starts to kind of slowly come up behind the the mask or under the mask, and just that slow, slow, slow with reveal of the face. I was like, that's the first time we see Michael Myers in the movie. It's gonna look just like it did back in those days. And then I saw it, and I'm like, that's not how it's supposed to look. He looks like a marshmallow man coming out of a. <laughs> like, are you keep saying that's not the way I wanted it? That's right. So that was, the, you know, like that's a, like an example you'll totally understand. Um, so things like that, like I would have done it so differently, so and, different. And by the time I get done putting this interview together on Windows Movie Maker, and all, you're going to pop up and go, hey, that's not the way I wanted that interview. <laughs> no, no, no. no, but I mean, you know what there is? Like I said, there's just something to be said about seeing it through, you know, from it, the, from the script to the screen. You know, and, and a movie is made again in the editing room. So I just love, I love the process of like taking all those pieces that you shot and making something out of that, you know? And like, that's that's a whole art form that I I respect greatly. And, um, you know, I just, and I've been fortunate to work with a great editor, you know, on these movies, uh, Dan Riddle, who is extremely patient <laughs> um, and just, you know, gives me, you know, the movie I want to see. And, and it's just been really, really great. Uh, but so, yeah, I think like, you know, so that would be, that would be my, my do over. And my, my next question is, where do you see yourself in five years? Oh God, retired, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Listen, I hope I'm still making movies. I, I can't believe that it's been over 20 years and I'm still doing what I do. It's like the, the gratitude I have. You, you have no idea. There's, there's not a day that like when I step onto a set or I have a meeting with some producer or, you know, whatever, I, I, I like... There's that little kid still inside me that just can't believe 
this is my life, you know, like that somehow I manifested these things for myself. And I hope that people who listen to this and who are also filmmakers or wanting to be filmmakers or wanting to follow that, you know, I think, and especially if you're younger, like go for it, don't be afraid. Rejection is just rejection, it's never personal. Um, and and just keep doing your thing because I feel like if I hadn't probably been as naive or probably even stupid as I was at the time, I, w I probably at this age I wouldn't be brave enough to do it, you know, because I know too much now. I know too much of how it, you know, that how it's supposed to really work. That it's, I, I think I just I would see more um, more of a downside to it. But when I was younger, it, it was it was like the challenge, you know. And so that that's that's all I can really say on that. But uh, yeah. Okay, and my next question is: Would you be interested in returning to Halloween? If so, <laughs> what role would you play? Like, would you be a director, writer? What would you do? Mm. Sure, but um, I I I wouldn't. I mean, listen, I wouldn't go at it from the same place I was back then you know now I'd be like you know let's let's make a deal I'll direct it I'll write it I'll you know I'll, I'll do what you want me to do but you know I need to have a little more creative stay in how it's gonna be um Work with you on a Halloween film I'm just saying yeah no but I mean but but you know what I think there's also because there are so all these multiple choose your own adventure versions of the Halloween franchise at this point I just think actually it'd be fun to go back and make an anthology Halloween movie, kind of like three. Really? Yeah. Well, not three, but but not to remake it, but to do a standalone Halloween story. You know, I, that's I'm not see. necessarily <laughs> Michael Myers, but might hint at it. He might be there somewhere. But I feel like there's so many different iterations of it now. Like you could actually kind of actually I think it'd be fun to pull together a movie where you had like Jamie Lloyd and Tommy Doyle and Laurie Strode and you know what I mean? Like you could like take all these legacy characters and bring them together somehow. Hmm, that would be interesting. Well, who knows? But I'm just saying, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily want to do Halloween 2020 where it's just a pick up from where we left off. You know what I mean? I'd want something that sort of, or maybe we go back and we make this sequel to six. You know? <laughs> People ask me all the yeah. time. Yeah, you know, I would love to see you do that. And if you ever want to do a Halloween film and you want somebody that has the passion Give me a call. I'll give, I will definitely give you a call on that one. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I just don't know. It's it's weird now because, you know, listen, it's not just Halloween, but all these franchises, you know, from the Marvel movies on, on outward from there, you know, everything is expanded universe now. So there's all kinds of ways you could do Halloween stories. You know, it's kind of a big open canvas. Now we have streaming platforms and things that didn't exist back then so you know maybe there's a halloween six we could pick up the story on netflix somehow you know what i mean there's just it's different ways so. to kind of like tell your story now it's not just limited to like every couple of years do another movie um you know there's webisodes we could do there's you know there's so many different ways to okay. tell so anyway, just, just, you know, but that's, you know, it's really, it's Malik's game and, and it's his thing. And I think you know, she's, he's done a pretty good job of like, you know, sort of shepherding it over the years. And I think it's, well, I mean, I, I, I respectfully disagree. I, I think, <laughs> I better, but you know, anyway, anyway, well, uh, but... you know, I think also, you know, Malik is sort of, you know, listen, I mean, there were a lot, I remember I talked to him when they were in the middle of playing, uh, putting together the deal for the latest one and. You know, I remember him saying, he's like, well, if I had any dark hair before, it's all gray now, because it was, it was a very, very difficult um, negotiation to try to put all of those pieces together. Um, you know, but Malik is also, he's a filmmaker in his own right, and I think he, he, he gets to the point where he understands, like, his is the business side of Halloween, and then he lets the creative people do what they want to do. So he's not one of those types of producers that interferes in the process all that much. I think well, I'm, still, yeah. I'm still waiting on him. I, hey, I would love to give him my number. Ah. <laughs> I'm sure it's a long line of people now. And I think, you know, the fact that, <clears throat> you know, it's funny, too, because people think that I was like this fanboy that just showed up one day. It wasn't that at all. Actually, I had sent over to their office a script that was not a Halloween script at all. 
Um, and it got to the hands of Ramsey Thomas, who had been the producer on number five. And Ramsey liked the writing, you know? So he saw, oh, uh, okay. He didn't know who I was. I didn't have an agent. I, you know, there was no, there was, I, I just managed to like say, oh, can, you know, can I send a script over? It was not a Halloween script. Um, it was another horror script I'd written and he liked it. And that's, that's how, that's how I got in the door there. It wasn't, it wasn't cause I had written Halloween, but when I showed up for the meeting, you know, I came in with this, I call it the Bible of Halloween. I'd spent weeks compiling, you know, the history of it all, the, the meaning of everything, the family tree of the whole thing. I'd made that logo, the Halloween 666 and it had the thorn on the A. I made all that. And it was like, the book, you know. <laughs> like oh I made my it. goodness, sir! I'm, I'm just—you don't know the kind of reaction I'm having right uh, now. So no, that's how I, and that's what I brought to me to the meeting with me, and that was in 1990. Yeah, 1990, and I didn't hear anything for four years. Four what? years, and. At the time, you know, there was there were stories in the Hollywood trades. Oh, Miramax bought the rights to the Halloween series. Oh, John Carpenter's going to do it. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, Quentin Tarantino's involved. Blah 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 blah. But all these stories were. And I was like, well, I'm I'm sunk. That's never going to happen. And then out of the blue, one day, my phone rings and it's Mustafa. He's like, come in. I want to talk to you about six. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. So I, and I, it's basically explained to me that they'd had a number of scripts. They had a start date to shoot this movie in Salt Lake City that fall. This was June. They had to start like October 1st. And they're like, we don't have anything. But you know what? Four years ago, you came to me and you dropped this off on my desk. And I have to tell you, everything we know about the Halloween movies is in this book you made. So he had it. Like he most, he kept that. Bible that I that sort of thing that I made with the with the artwork on it on his desk <laughs> like like they you could tell like had referred to it you know yeah. sort of the company diagram for the Halloween series so he's like your passion for this like that's how I remembered you because you did this so you know it's and then once I have to say you know you have to do things to stand out from the crowd you have to be the one to be more passionate more knowledgeable because there's so many other people in line you're right you're absolutely right. And I guess my final question would be for you, what's next for you? What's next for Daniel Ferens? Tell mm -hmm. us. Hopefully a vacation this year, because I haven't had one of those in years. Uh, but all kidding aside, uh, I have another movie coming out um, on April 5th. It's called The Haunting of Sharon Tate. It is not what people think. Um, well, there's been a lot of controversy around this movie, and it's sort of upsets me in a way because people haven't seen it and I think it's a little early to judge. Um, I did not make a movie about Charles Manson or the Manson family or glamorizing these murders. In fact, what I made was a redemptive movie where the question of the movie is if we know what our fate is, can we change it? Yeah. And that's what this movie deals with. It's Sharon Tate having some knowledge of what her fate will be and finding the power within herself to rewrite her book if you will it definitely and sounds interesting it's definitely interesting hillary duff uh i have to say really stepped up her game and played sharon tate which was difficult enough but she also had never made a horror movie in her life i mean this was you know lizzie mcguire and you know the pop star and i mean a sweetheart um but I loved her for this part because she was, there was something, there's a purity about her. She's very beautiful, but like, she's just, there's a sweetness to her that I really thought audiences would understand and root for her because of who she is. It and, sounds and, good. And, and if, you know, it's totally up to you, but if you ever want to come back, you're welcome to come oh, back. Yeah, of course. Anytime. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that when it's, we're closer to the release, but, uh, uh, yeah, so that's coming up. I'm super excited about the release of that. In fact, we have uh, we was just we were just notified that we won three awards for that movie at the uh, Hollywood Real Independent Film Festival. So the movie will screen there here in Los Angeles uh, for the very first time uh, on February 15th, and that's a Friday, and it's at LA Live downtown LA. I think the tickets are available online. 
Um, super excited to see it with the cast and crew and audience members who you know don't know anything about this movie. But um, yeah, so if you, you know, I'm trying to spread the good word about that film as well. All right, so I, I just want to thank you for being here and to all the listeners that are listening to this. I'm the Myers fan, and I've been here with Daniel Ferens, the writer of The Curse of Michael Myers, and of course he's the man behind the new Amityville film entitled The Amityville Murders. Such a great film, sir. Thank you so much for being here. You are my hero. You've been quite a beat. You're the best, man. Well, take care and th keep up all the, the hard work that you're doing. And I love that you're so passionate about everything that uh, that you talk about and, and get excited about and, and get behind the fans and the films. And, you know, I know you have your favorites, but I appreciate all the love and support. It really means a lot. Thank you so much. You take care. I will. Thank okay. you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, folks. From the man himself, writer and director Daniel Ferens, you got the story behind the Amityville murders. I enjoyed having him on the channel today. He's Daniel Ferens, I'm the Michael Myers fanatic, and I approve this message.